Hi everyone. All right. June 14th, 1999. I arrive in Mumbai to participate in the finals of a nationwide hunt for video jockeys on MTV. I walk into the studio, which has a very edgy, fun, fashionable, cool vibe. The average size of people in this room is zero. And the average age is 16. I'm a decade older. I'm a married advertising executive with a degree in business management. Everyone backstage is animatedly showcasing their knowledge of music and international acts to each other. And I am standing there paralyzed, dead sure that I'm the odd one out. I'm the anomaly. I'm the mistake. I'm an experiment. I'm a lab rat and definitely not what MTV is looking at. So for all you Gen Z people out here, let me just explain to you what MTV was in 1999. MTV was then a cult for an entire generation. It was the school for teenage cool. MTV VJs were youth icons. They, they carried poodles in a plane. Okay, they, What they said became youth catchphrases. What they wore became you know, fashion trends. So to be invited directly to the final 10 Competing for this job was the biggest life opportunity for a newly minted TV host. Something you just don't refuse. You don't refuse to be part of this where the top, top 10 hopefuls are actually uh, to be judged on uh, their ability to the, at the VJ hunt, the final. It's a huge televised final where the top 10 hopefuls were to be judged on their ability to interview celebrities on the spot, which I managed just fine. Showcase their dancing abilities. Not my best foot forward. Okay, strut on the runway. Something they don't teach you at management school, obviously. And finally, showcase the one talent that they thought they represent, that best represented them. Now, this was my only chance. And I sort of wrote a cheeky parody piece where I would spoof Simi Garewal. I don't know how many of you, well, are familiar with her work, but spoofing Simi Garewal interviewing Mamta Kulkarni. Okay. She's an actor who is in complete contrast with Simi's hyper finesse. Let's just put it that way. Now, I knew I wasn't making great progress and hadn't struck a great impression so far. So my competitive side was like literally blowing smoke signals up my brain. Okay? It was my big do or die. It was my big kill, my big chance. So I peep out of the wings and lo and behold, in the A plus celebrity laden judges, there she was in all her white splendor, Simi Garewal. Unbelievable. Of all the people that I had to spoof, I picked a judge. I was going to be mincemeat on live television in three minutes, flat. I needed to change my act. So I mentally raced through all my other performing talents. Could I sing? No, not really. Could I dance? Hell no. Could I do magic tricks? Oh yes, I could totally make myself disappear from this and avoid this public suicide, obviously. But damn, the only thing I was good at was being funny and spontaneous and cheeky. And just then, Vijay Malaika announces my name and I find myself walking onto a dark stage with a spotlight in the center set up for my act. I look up and I see 100,000 people, film directors, Actors, designers, Bombay's glitterati, and Simi. And then an epiphanous moment happened. I was definitely going to fail, but hell, this was my moment and I was going to take it. So I arched my eyebrows and I pasted a benign smile on my face and I began. And here's what happened. I won. I won in that, in that fearless moment, my career as a TV presenter took birth and I managed to turn that disaster into an opportunity and the sheer audacity and recklessness of my act won over the judges and Simi. Well, what I really want to tell you through this long winded dramatized story is that in my life, what the one thing I've really learned is that life is 10% about what is thrown at you and 90% about how we react to it. 
My entire life, I've been thrown opportunities that made absolutely no sense at that time. But I have grabbed them with both hands, with a prayer on my lips, every single time. And I think I am who I am today because of the consequences of those choices. Some experiments worked out, some didn't work out. But I learned more about myself when I failed than when I succeeded. Some of them took me towards experiences I would have never had had I not failed. And now because this is a management school and I know you guys love structure, here's my 101 on taking risks and experiments. All right, bring out those cutlers. Okay, here's what I think I've learned. You have to reach beyond your bubble. I left a medical college to study English literature. I got myself an MBA and opted to get placed in an advertising agency. You guys don't know how deviant that was considered at that point of time, okay, in, during campus placement. Now, a chance opportunity to sit in for a model who hadn't showed up landed me a huge Ray-Ban campaign. Here it was. I wasn't looking out to be a model, but at the risk of, you know, being looked at as a lightweight by, and frivolous by my business school peers, I jumped right in. Bring it on. And just that impulsive move got me so many more amazing campaigns that led me to being you know, asked and invited to host a game show. And I had no idea whether I'd even be able to see a line straight or string a straight sentence. But as soon as the camera was switched on and action was called, I just knew that this was my calling. I felt so comfortable and calm. And I would have never, ever known this feeling had I not jumped in. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is focus on you not on what others think about you or what they think you would be good at. I gave up sitting in neat little boxes a long, long time ago. Um, the second learning is bet on yourself. I remember so, so clearly thinking a million times about throwing away a coveted job that I was so good at to explore a field I had absolutely no training or degree in. I can still picture myself shivering in my management trainee shoes at the ad agency telling the biggest creative director in the city that I was taking a break so I could explore being a TV host. It could have been the worst decision of my life, but somehow I knew I had to take that punt on myself. I, I just did it and I couldn't believe what he said. He said, well, I know you're made for bigger stuff and sign me an autograph and please know that we'll always keep space in this organization for you should you always you know, want to come back. I never ever, you know, thought he would say that and I never went back either but it was just good knowing that I was highly valued as a management trainee and that was a big boost. So always know your worth and always take a bigger bet on yourself than you think you should take, right? Don't undervalue yourself, jump high. Um, drop the fear factor, I'm talking about the game show, okay? You already know what happened at the MTV VJ hunt but let me tell you, the job of a TV host is not exactly a bed of roses. In fact, it's a, it's a highly underrated one. And this is not a rant. Okay. Um, TV, good TV hosts are like good whiskey. Okay. You no one misses a smooth, smoky, single malt. But you'll always remember the one that gave you a bad hangover. All right. So those are the ones you remember. What we do out there is turn into glue that sort of seamlessly holds together a show or an event, an interview you know, use smooth talking maneuvers to fill back-end screw-ups that are absolutely inevitable. But let me tell you about this bizarre evening where I was hosting a very prominent awards night with an audience of like 2000 and it was being telecast live. Now that was a big thing then, we used to telecast live, now there's no question of it. There were 100 awards to be given, there were politicians and prominent people to be given out by 200 other prominent people, all in very dynamic stages of arrival. There are no retakes in a live event. And even if your socks are sliding off under all that composure, you can't possibly give up and run. You have to hold forth. So this particular time, the backstage team would keep changing the order of my 150 cue cards like it was a game of snakes and ladders. And then suddenly the teleprompter goes off and I just go on rambling impromptu because I had no idea what was coming up next. And just then my co-host, Bumblebee, accidentally knocks off all the cue cards off the podium and now we don't even know what the latest flow of the show is. And this is all live television. I have never been in such pressure and never been at such wit's end ever again in my life. But at that moment, I recognized that 
the moment needed me more than my fear did. And I sort of held on with the bravado of, you know, the captain of the Titanic, you know, till uh, my million cue cards were rearranged and said back to me, but I did it and actually made people laugh. And it actually, nobody noticed that this had happened, but I knew. So my take on this is when you've got to crack a risky situation, don't let fear be a factor. Just plod on. No one will know. Fake it till you make it. All right. Don't judge your own mistakes. Just don't do it. Show me one person who doesn't make mistakes. And if you are not going to admit to your own mistakes and use them to better your game, then what is the point of failing at all? Have all my experiments worked out? Not by a mile. I don't think so. I'm still terrible with auditions. Okay, the only acting projects that I've acted in are the ones where they were so sure I was the one that they didn't bother auditioning me. But I have yet to land a single project where I have auditioned as an actor and, uh, you know, got the landed the role. Because as a presenter, I'm so used to being freehand and spontaneous that I freeze when I know I'm being judged for what I'm doing. It's a major setback. It's a problem. But I don't kill myself for it. I try to overcome it. I finally played the lead in a show, Mind the Mrozas, and I got six be Best Actor Awards for it. I mean, that was a win, wasn't it? <laughs> So, my take on this is, please don't be harsh on yourself. Recognize the hard work that you do and respect yourself for it. And most importantly, I don't have a slide for it because I wrote this on the plane when I was coming here. I think one of the most important things I've learned is to invest in people, in relationships. Um, anyone can make money if they're good at what they do, right? But the connection you make with people you meet, the ones you work with, forms the basis of your own character. And that has so far, thus far, been the most gratifying part of my job, connecting with people, meeting people, learning from them, understanding, and it's made me grow. So never treat people badly on your way up because you're definitely meeting them on your way down. And I know this, I can tell you this from experience. And after two decades in the business of entertainment where I produce, I write, I interview, I host, I act, I moderate, I create. I'm still asked what I want to do next, but truth be told, I have never done anything in my life that had a map. I walk in every direction that calls out to me and I always sort of find a path to walk on. So yes, I cannot really give you the recipe for success, but I can give you a recipe of failure, not giving it a shot, okay? Not doing your experiments and not taking risks. That's a sure shot recipe of failure. So I am going to leave you with my favorite quote from my favorite comic writer, David Sedaris. It's right here. Read it. And thank you all for having me today. It's a short talk, but that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>